there's a lot of things that he outlined in this prophecy. I'm going to paraphrase some of the things that he said that had contributed to him being sentenced so harshly. <laughs> What's up family my name is felicity and welcome to congo talks 243 if this is your first time i would encourage you to subscribe just so you're notified when i post new videos and for those of you who have been here for a long time welcome back i'm so glad you're still here so today's video is a story it's a story about a great man his name was simon kimbangu i'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about him and you have even suggested that i speak about him on this channel so today we will be discovering who he was and what he did and what makes him such an important figure in the history of, of the DRC. So Simon Kimbangu today is said to have been a prophet who healed the sick, brought the dead back to life, and he also prophesied about the liberation of Congo and also the African continent at large. His ministry only lasted for a few months, but he, it attracted a lot of following that it slowly started to be seen as a threat to the colonial rule. Today, Simon Kimbangu is considered to be one of the most influential people who kind of shaped the history of Congo as well as that of Congo's surrounding states. So who was he? Simon Kimbangu was born in 1887 and he was born in Nkamba. Nkamba is a little town in the southwestern part of Congo. And he grew up at the time when Congo was under the Belgian colonial rule. So this was a very difficult time. He grew up as a Protestant and got baptized at the age of 28 in 1915. After his baptism, it is said that he started having visions from heaven. And these visions basically were revealing to him that he had a special mission. It is said that initially he decided to run away from that mission because he considered himself not to be fit to carry out the mission. During that period of time, he relocated because he was kind of like sick of receiving those visions. First, he moved to Kinshasa and then he decided to move to other lower parts of Western Congo. He did that for a few years and when he was going to all of those different places, he tried to kind of get himself involved into different business ventures. But he noticed that everything that he was doing was not working and he continued to have these visions telling him that he had a special mission he had to accomplish. And so the difficulties kind of forced him to go back to Nkamba where he was meant to start his mission. So finally he did go back and in 1921 he started his public ministry. His first public ministry was in April of 1921 and during this gathering he is said to have prayed for the sick and they were healed and in many more events that happened after that first one many more miracles happened. So he would pray for the sick, the blind, the disabled and everybody was kind of receiving their solution. He would even pray for people who would be dead and they would come back to life. So unavoidably this movement attracted a lot of following. This is where the difficulties started presenting themselves. Of course there was support as well and also opposition. The support of this movement movement mainly came from the Congolese people and also partly from the Protestant community because for them they saw him as a product of themselves you know and they said it was possible for God to be using him this was the Protestant view but for the Congolese people they believed that this was God's gift you know to the Congolese people and the opposition mainly started coming from the Catholic Church the Catholic community and also from the colonial authorities so the Catholic missionaries and some protestant missionaries as well they were seeing everything that was happening because of kimbangu everything that kimbangu was doing and they saw that it, it was real but apparently they couldn't support him because he was one of the sheeps and they couldn't allow the sheep to lead the shepherd and for them the shepherds were missionaries you know european missionaries so they couldn't follow what kimbangu was doing because he was native so he didn't have that much that much freedom to be expressing himself that way or to be leading the people who were ruling Congo at that time. So these oppositions multiplied themselves over time. They even forced the Kimbanguists and the Kimbanguists are people who follow Kimbangu's gospel. So they forced the Kimbanguists to stop singing some of the protestant songs that they were singing. This is one of the reasons why if you go to Congo today in many Kimbanguist churches they sing songs that are exclusively their own. As for the colonial authorities they may have been scared that this movement would result into some type of rebellion against the colonial rule which it eventually did but it wasn't because of Kimbangu's movement it was more because of how the colonial authorities reacted 
to the movement. We have to understand that the Belgian authorities were the last people to kind of react to the movement of Kimbangu. They got complaints from many groups of people. These included news agencies and they also included traders, for example, who were complaining that the events that Kimbangu was holding was kind of disrupting the normal the normal functioning of the society so basically during all of these public events people would leave their workplaces so people working in construction sites railways black congolese people working in white european homes would leave hospitals were almost empty so hospital workers would head over to hear kimbangu speak so this is why the colonial authorities decided to put an end to it so in june of that same year 1921 the belgian administration for the region of Nkamba decided to invade Nkamba with some soldiers and to arrest Kimbangu and all his followers. They didn't succeed during this time and Kimbangu and his followers managed to escape. When they escaped, he continued his ministry but he couldn't do it openly anymore so he was in hiding. He was doing it but in hiding. And finally, in September of that same year, 1921, he decided to hand himself over to the authorities to be arrested. After he was arrested, he was charged with a lot of things. They said that he was guilty of advertising false miracles and that he was also guilty of troublemaking. His court trial only lasted for about 18 days and basically the court ruled that he would be sentenced to death. So initially he was sentenced to death before later on being sentenced to life imprisonment. He remained in prison until he passed away in 19. 51. So in total, he spent about 30 years in prison. But being sentenced to death or to life imprisonment, these are undeniably very harsh. So one might ask, why was he sentenced that harshly? History reveals that this harsh sentencing was in a big way a result of a prophecy that Simon Kimbangu announced to the Congolese people before he handed himself over to be arrested. And there's a lot of things that he outlined in this prophecy. I'm going to paraphrase some of the things that he he said that had contributed to him being sentenced so harshly. I am going to paraphrase it based on a French translation of the original Kikongo prophecy. I took that French translation and translated it in English for you guys, just so you have an idea of what are some of the sentences or some of the phrases that were included in this prophecy to make the colonial officials act the way that they did. So some of the things that were included in this prophecy were that in the years to come, Congo would receive its independence twice. There would be a first independence and then there would be a second independence. He also said that the first independence of Congo would be led by a son of Congo and this son of Congo would have the power of the Holy Spirit in him. The black man would kick the white man out of his land. And then after all of this happened, the fight for the second independence would begin. He said that the first independence would be a bit easier than the second independence because the second independence would not just be about kicking foreigners out of Congo. So it would be a lot harder. When Congo would be free, then the rest of the African continent would be free. This is after the second independence of Congo. And another thing that he said that was strongly despised by the Belgian colonial officials at that time was the fact that he announced to the people that after Congo's second independence, the white would become black and the blacks would become white. These are some of the things that were included in his prophecy. I would stop there about that, but I would encourage you to Google the prophecy of Simon Kimbangu in your free time. It has many things that are very eye-opening, especially for those who know the history of, of Congo, the history of the DRC. Like You would find a lot of striking similarities between the history of Congo and what is happening in Congo right now and the prophecy. Of, of Simon Kimbangu. So moving on, he passed away in 1951, but his movement did not stop there. In fact, his imprisonment alone was used as a means to oppose the colonial authorities. What his movement did is it now made people aware of the colonial presence in Congo. It made them aware of the differences that existed between the white people who were in Congo at that time and the black people. It kind of gave Congolese people a nationalist 
anti-colonial kind of sentiment but this effect was not just specific to congo it also inspired a lot of surrounding states angola was one of the states that also was influenced by this movement it also spread in congo brazzaville for example so in a way kimbangu was the first expression of the 20th century congolese nationalism and many other movements came to life because of kimbangu's movement a very good example of some of the movements that came to life were the movement of Simao Toko from Angola and there was also the movement of Simon Mpadi in the DRC and others. So after he died, his wife decided to lead the movement, led it to the point where it was officially recognized by the Belgian officials as an African independent church in 1959. Today the church is headquartered in, in Kamba where the ministry started and it has branches all over the country. Even when I was in Congo there was a church where I was living that was a Kimbanguist church but I never really took the time to even visit to see how they worship, what it's about. You know the fact that a lot of Congolese people don't know these stories is not so much about them not wanting to learn these stories but it's so much about the education system. Our education system was actually built during the colonial time. So of course the, the colonial officials cannot really present themselves in a bad light. So the education system presents them as friends who came to live with us in harmony. So a lot of the things that we are finding right now, we are finding them after and independently. We don't we don't learn these things. So I never even knew, you know, like the history behind this church. But anyway, that's just my own my own life input. <laughs> so that was all for today's video, guys. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and also subscribe. Please share these videos to people so that more people get to hear about these empowering stories. Let me know in the comment what you think about the story of Simon Kimbangu and what do you know about him that I may not have covered? For those of you guys who know about him, let us know in the comments. And those of you who are hearing about Simon Kimbangu for the first time, what did you think about his story? Does it inspire you? Let us know in the comments and I will see you guys next time in the next videos. Bye!